Hello and welcome to episode 8 of Unpacking Articles. My name is Florencia Henshaw. I have a PhD in Second Language Acquisition from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And the article we're going to be unpacking today is a book chapter called Communicative Language Teaching, Current Status and Future Prospects. And what Nina Spada is doing in this book chapter is distinguishing what communicative language teaching is from what it's not. And communicative language teaching is really an umbrella term at this point. And this makes it so hard to define. It is not a monolithic approach. And not everybody identifies with communicative language teaching, but they may identify with approaches that you could say fall under communicative language teaching methods, such as task-based language teaching, content-based, comprehension-based, etc. Some common associations with CLT, communicative language teaching, are that is meaning-based, that is learner-centered, that our focus is fluency over accuracy, etc. But of course, it's all going to depend on whether people are thinking of the strong versus the weak versions of CLT. The strong version of CLT, you could say, is closer to content-based, whereas a weak version of CLT is more form-focused, but there's still communicative practice integrated in it. Where does communicative language teaching come from? Well, it's essentially a reaction to the structural syllabus. We have switched our views on how languages are acquired, and we have realized that we acquire them through engaging meaningfully with the language, as opposed to learning about the language. There's two hypotheses that are key to shaping what we know as communicative language teaching, and they are Krashen's input hypothesis and Long's interaction hypothesis. Now, one thing that is interesting is that Krashen and Long had different views when it came to focus on form, which we unpacked in another video. And I think precisely because these two hypotheses play a role in CLT and yet they view form-focused instruction very differently, this is why we end up with so many different versions of communicative language teaching or why educators implement communicative language teaching differently. A lot of misconceptions about communicative language teaching are indeed rooted in the fact that these two hypotheses view form-focused instruction so differently. And some of the misconceptions that Spada outlines in her article are that CLT only focuses on meaning, that there's no focus on form, that there are no explicit corrections whenever a student produces an error, that it is all about the learners, it is learner-centered as opposed to teacher-centered, and that we focus on listening and speaking much more than reading and writing, and that only the target language is used in class by both the teachers and the students. So Spada says these are myths associated with CLT. In other words, these are things that people think CLT is all about, and yet she is going to make a point that this is not true. So the first two myths, myth one and two, are all about this issue of focus on form. Spada essentially says that it's not a matter of if we should be focusing on form, but how we should be focusing on form. When it comes to myth two, error correction, she says that it's okay as long as we are still focusing on communicating. For example, recast, which we will unpack in another video. So there is a place for form-focused instruction within communicative language teaching. And in this quote, she summarizes it best and it says, CLT was not conceptualized as an approach that was intended to exclude form but rather one that was intended to include communication. And she later says, the research to date supports the advantages of a balance of form and meaning in L2 classrooms. It will take time to discover more precisely what that balance is. 
And there it is. That's the fine print. And that is what has driven so much research on focus on form, right? To what extent is it beneficial? And when we say beneficial, what do we mean by it? It's good for what? Okay, let's go to myths three and four, which are about this obsession <laughs> with learners talking, right? That it is a learner center and it's all about listening and talking. It's about oral communication. This comes from a pendulum swing from the grammar translation and the audiolingual methods. Grammar translation was very much about writing and writing accurately. The audiolingual methods were about individuals listening and repeating. So there was very little learner initiated interaction. So the pendulum swing was to say learners need to be more in charge and it needs to be about them communicating what they want to communicate. And of course, we can blame the interaction hypothesis for this myth to some extent, right? The interaction hypothesis is very much about interacting orally. However, Spada makes it a point to highlight that comprehension is communication, that reading is part of CLT. So we cannot forget the importance of reading for language development, the importance of comprehension for language development. And we need to move away from equating communication with oral interaction. And the last myth is a controversial one. <laughs> and this is that using the first language or the shared language other than the target language is bad, right? That in the communicative language classroom, we keep it all in the target language. Spada says that is a myth and that recognizing the importance of L2 input doesn't mean that we need to ban or forbid the L1 in the classroom. But the fine print here is that it depends on the context. And I'm just going to put this quote out here. Not everybody's going to agree with it, but this is what Spada has to say about it. And it says, in foreign language settings where the learner's exposure to the target language is restricted to the classroom, it is advisable to maximize target language exposure and minimize L1 use. For minority language learners who are at risk of losing their L1 as they are mainstreamed into the majority language and culture, maximizing opportunities for L1 use as a basis for L2 learning is recommended. Inspana concludes with a brief discussion on the post-method pedagogy movement. This discussion revolves around the questions of whether we should still be using the term communicative language teaching as an approach, since right now when someone says, I follow communicative language teaching, you cannot really picture what that person is envisioning because it means so many different things to so many different people. And also, should we still even be talking about methods? Now, Spada writes this quote, clarifying that the concept of method is not the problem, but rather how it is used. And she later says that methods should not be understood as prescriptions for classroom behavior and imposed on teachers as a strict set of procedures to follow. And so the takeaway for me is principles over labels. It is important that our teaching be guided by principles of second language acquisition and for us to understand why certain things contribute to language development and others may not. That to me is much more important than a label, whether that is CLT, TBLT, CI, TPRS, or any other label. After all, labels are meaningless if we cannot justify why we do what we do. That's just my take on it. As usual, I encourage you to read the article for yourself and draw your own conclusions. Thank you for tuning in and until next time.